Coming up on this week's show, we've got a lot to work through. We're going to kick off with PS4, then move on to the still unannounced next Xbox, and after that, talk about some of the tech which is going to be driving next gen games. If you like the sound of all that, don't forget to subscribe. So we start this week's show with some uh, PS4 chat, Dan, it's still the only announced next-gen console, and this week Sony's president of Worldwide Studios, Shuhei Yoshida, has been talking about how he doesn't want the PS4 to be just kind of a box that plays first-person shooters. Yeah, this was a deliberate that they showed Knack, which is the uh, little polygon triangle man game, uh, which looks a bit like a sort of Pixar reject, I suppose, but essentially it's like a big tech demo of little triangle men, and it was quite a deliberate policy to show that game first. And in fact, uh, Shuhei was speaking to our sister magazine, Edge, and he said uh, Mark Cerny's idea was, uh, what about Crash Bandicoot for PS4? And I guess when they all blanked that idea, or as you pointed out, it's probably not even theirs to own anyway. Um, he said, well, he suggested the concept of Knack. And he says, uh, we hate to see all PS4 games being shooters or action adventures, so um, we'd like to show you something else. And that was a deliberate thing to show that first. Do you think it was successful? Uh, well, it was successful in the sense that it wasn't a shooter. On that, <laughs> on that level, he did triumph, but um, not entirely. And the, the response was quite, quite muted to it. I think uh, until you mentioned we were going to be talking about NAC today, I'd forgotten it existed, which mm. probably isn't your average marketeer's dream. But what was more interesting, I think, is in the same uh, the same PS4 presentation at the big reveal, they talked about well, they brought John Blow out on stage and they mm. talked about bringing indies to the machine. And I think a lot of what we've heard from people who attended GDC is that. Indie developers have been quite uh, quite smitten by the PS4's tech. I think it can use a, I can't remember, I think it's called the Unity engine, which is a kind of off-the-shelf uh, yeah. engine for designing indie games. So it's relatively easy to get their software up and running. There's also the suggestion of having a, a model that's almost self-publishing, so you'd be able to ch- kind of chuck your game up with the, the price point you want, without having to go through some of the kind of the burning hoops that mm. seem to be in place on on Microsoft platforms. So, I mean, do you see that being a big part of the PS4's kind of appeal, the fact that it's going to have this breadth of gameplay in terms of uh, some, some sort of stranger and more esoteric experiences, perhaps, like you get with Steam? Yeah, I think they're trying to move it closer to almost the iPad experience, where, um, you know, a core part of the console is the fact that it's, well, like, almost always on in the respect that, you know, you turn the PS4 on and it's all there, ready to go. You're not waiting for loading times. You're not doing big permanent installs. And as part of that, if you've got a big, vibrant marketplace of like experimental indie experiences, it really snack price, you know, offerings that I think that makes it a much more exciting machine. Because you turn it on, you're not just labouring to turn on your big half hour install AAA game. You know, you are filtering with little different things. Well, there's as been well. so much talk, hasn't there, about the the death of AAA. I can't mm. believe I did air quotes just then. <laughs> Sorry about that. But but that not every game needs to be a twelve to fifteen hour epic, and perhaps having having those sort of smaller experiences which can be bought for less and kind of played in a few hours is a uh, is something punters want nowadays. And and if you're trying to make money, then then perhaps that's a a sensible way of going about things. Not having to wager a kind of a hundred million dollar development bill on on a game that may or may not succeed and will take a, a number of years to come out. You need to see Tomb Raider struggling off the back of three million sales and apparently that being disappointing to uh, mm. to see the trouble that AAA's been in. But again, they will be hoping kind of ticks the AAA boxes is a drive club. And uh, the developer of that, I believe, has been talking about the part they played in helping to design the, uh, the controller for PS4. Yeah, uh, Scott Kirkland was speaking again to our sister magazine, Edge, and Scott's involved on the tech side with them. And um, he said, uh, we were instrumental in securing the specific gyro components that will go in the Dual Shock 4. He says, we have prototypes that demonstrated the really, I don't understand these words entirely, <laughs> the really high frequency gyros that were the ones that were there to shut the controller around like a steering wheel. So is that for your six axis sort of motion stuff or is that or is that just for how the, the, the I, sticks work? I think it's the six axis motion stuff. Um, and he also spoke about the uh, the triggers and that you know no one's outside of Sony has touched the pad yet, but he was talking about how if you put the PlayStation 4 pad down on a table, the way the triggers are designed and they're quite weighty and they just feel really solid. They're not going to like accidentally tip onto the triggers and drive it itself when you put is, it is down. Is that because the prime concern when playing games is that the pad started playing it's, itself? It's the main reason I won't risk playing a driving game <laughs> for fear of putting the pad down and driving off a cliff. What I found interesting about what he was saying about the controller was that not only were they involved, but I think a number of other kind of first mm. and second party studios were, including Gorilla who uh, I think had input into the triggers and, and in terms of what kind of FPS gamers would yeah. want from it. So yeah. I guess that the pad will be an amalgam of those sorts of ideas that have been fed in by, by key Sony devs. I mean, that's 
the other interesting thing is obviously they had Mark Cherney on stage mm. uh, as the architect, I think, very much of, of PS4 and what it could do. And the fact that they're taking the cues so much from software developers rather than perhaps hardware engineers is all part of, I guess, that big Sony seller. This is this is the games machine mm. that plays games and is for gamers and kind of games, 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 hashtag games. I don't think it's just, I mean, they said this themselves, it's not just spiel that one of the pillars of PS4 is sharing, and in quite literal sense, where there's a share button, but within the company, the idea was that they share ideas. I was reading again in Edge that, you know, when they have their first party software meetings now, that, uh, you know, Shuhei Yoshida suggested they actually drink at the meeting to make everyone a bit more calm. <laughs> oh, I just talked about the staff. <laughs> Definitely need a drink there. <laughs> so, um,. Yeah, and uh, you know, it's it's things like that that enable people to come up with ideas like let's reduce the dead zone on our PlayStation Four. But that's, and I suppose you can blame it on being on being pissed if it all goes wrong. Exactly. So next up onto whatever Microsoft's next console is, still currently unnamed, still currently unannounced. But Dan, that hasn't stopped the rumor mill. Another week, another set of rumors. First up, a lot of talk about what the uh, next version of Connect is going to be able to do. Yeah, there's been a lot of talk about Connect 2.0 and quite how responsive it will be. Well, the latest voodoo is that they suggest that when you're watching TV using Connect, um, or you know, in fact, one of the things will be you'll be able to plug a cable directly into your box, so it'll almost be like a skybox. Um, but you'll be watching TV, and if I was to do that, I would no longer be watching TV. Partly because I'm looking this direction, and partly because Connect would know that I was no longer looking at the television. Well, hang on, that sounds awful. So it could be, if you were to like be talking to someone in the other room, the TV would be going... What if you're looking out the window? Well, you, then you're not watching television. But if so, someone sat with you might be, still want to be watching. That's madness. Well, it could be madness. And I don't know if they say only if two sets of eyes removed from the television, it pauses. Maybe, that, the, maybe the future's going to be awful. We're best off staying in the past, Dan, where we are. If my experience of things like Siri on the iPhone is anything to measure by, I think some elements of the future aren't quite yet fully functional. If you're, uh, I don't know if you, how much of a Kinect file are you, but have you seen uh, the, uh, the Cinematograph Paranormal Activity 4? No. The Kinect is a key part of the plot. Really? Because the Kinect can spot the, uh, the evil spirits, spoilers. That's, really? That's real, yeah. Well, so, that film's ruined, thanks. So, uh, I don't know what Kinect 2.0 will be able to do. Spot the devil, perhaps. But, uh, yeah, it's a terrible piece of product placement. <laughs> I, uh, I both recommend it and don't recommend it to anyone watching. But So what else has been happening in Xbox land? Well, it seems that you know the push for TV and entertainment's really where they're at. Uh, and we just talked about Sony and their push for indies and for games. Well, I think for Microsoft, the real power of their push is in you know entertainment, the big box. Uh, now apparently they've been uh, they've bought some technology called well, I've got to look this up because I'll never remember it video surf technology, which doesn't mean much to me. But apparently it's like a, an innovative new way to catalog and tag videos. That's so it. That, that's your big excitement at E3, isn't it? Cataloging. <laughs> Ever wonder why you couldn't tag your videos? And you can now. You can use gestures and voice control to streamline the way the streamline the way you search, consume, and share content. Can't be consuming content, I always say that. Are you excited about that? I, it, it, the words sound awful, but I mean, in reality, it might work really well, you know, like we talked about this thing so, where you move your head all the time. So, so is the idea you have like a super organized library of your stuff, is that? Is that yeah, I, I mean, I guess that you have a super organized visual library and you might just, you know, be able to use Connect to live the dream of, what you might call it, minority report, you know, that kind of thing. Is I, that the dream? Is I that still know, the dream? Well, I don't know. Look, I, minority report, I think, has probably set the industry back 20 years. Like, everyone's been banging on about that glove stuff mm. for, forever. I, I, in fact, I'll come on to something similar, a similar mind to that later. Uh, but there's also been some sad news in Microsoft mm. land, which was uh, the chap we spoke about on the last episode who, uh, who sounded off a bit about... He was defending. Uh, he was defending the potentially always on future of the the next Xbox. This is Adam Orth, who was yeah. then Creative Studios, I think, head. Is yeah. is no longer. Is no more. Yeah, Orth Orth is gone. Um, there's been all sorts of ranges of puns because what happened was he he put out some tweets with a friend of his saying always on and the hashtag deal with it. Now, as someone said, he's like dealt with and that sort of thing. Or Adam always off. As someone said slightly harshly. Well, well done, internet. Yeah, I take no, I take no pleasure in a man losing his job. Be it, Do you think he had to lose his job after saying that stuff? I, I mean, I don't know. I, I you know, I, I bounce it back to you. I don't know. Did you think he, he jumped? Did you think he had to walk? Uh, I don't know. 
I think Microsoft has a... Yeah, I mean, I don't know what actually happened to him, obviously, I should say that. But I think Microsoft obviously has a, a strong policy of, uh, of containing rumours and of being mm. quite careful with the information it puts out. So it wouldn't have liked someone who could be perceived as a figurehead. That's the problem, I guess. If, if you look like someone whose word, who, who might be in the know and should be taken yeah. seriously, then you, you, of course, have to be quite careful what you say. We've all, uh, we've all made mistakes on social media. God knows I have, and it would be it's a shame to lose your, your job over it. What I think is perhaps more interesting is there seems to have been like a, a flurry of rumours this week suggesting... Were people sort of perhaps suggesting that the always on stuff isn't either quite as as, as damaging as one imagine it might be, or it might not yeah. even be there at all? What's, do, do you think Microsoft will launch a console with that requires a constant instant <sighs> internet connection? Uh, you know, again, I <laughs> hey, this is why you come to this show. I don't know, <laughs> um, but you know, again, the rumours demand you speculate. <laughs> yeah, the rumours swirl from week to week. I think there's definitely something in the always on and we wouldn't have heard six months of rumours saying there's something always on. Now whether now the delay, as we speculated, whether the delay in the reveal is because they're, they're desperately trying to make Plum it less pepper. always on, to make it like Sometimes almost on. always on, <laughs> Mostly almost on. on every three minutes. Uh, you know, that could be part of it. But the now, timing couldn't have been worse for Microsoft, could it? Because over the weekend just gone, there was, oh. I think, in the US and the UK, a, yeah. a fairly lengthy Xbox Live outage. I think it lasted for about 10 hours where people couldn't log on. I think the, the question that people are going to want to be looking to see answered at the eventual re reveal of the next Xbox is what happens when the internet is down like is it going to stop me playing the physical games i've bought mm. will it stop me watching films that i've downloaded but are just sat on my hard drive that's the kind of stuff they're going to be called on yeah uh, and maybe there are satisfactory answers to those questions well apparently there's a leak this week from uh, vg leaks that's what they do they leak things about vg well yeah right. and um it says xbox 720 will have always on functionality but it will not prevent the use of secondhand games nor bar people from playing local content when they're without the internet so I guess so that being so, that doesn't sound that bad. No, it doesn't sound that bad. It this sounds... isn't going to be a case the internet's made a big fuss over nothing, is well, it? Well, I mean, heaven forbid, but yeah, we, we'll see soon enough, I imagine. Dan, one of the more unusual things uh, that I read this week was that mm. there's a suggestion there's going to be two flavours of Xbox and that one will be a kind of a, a stripped back sort of model. Yeah, this is quite strange. I mean, last week we talked about two flavours of Xbox 720. The rumour this week is that there's going to be a stripped back Xbox 360 ah. that acts like a sort of media box. And it, effectively, it's like almost like a backward combat compatibility. That's easy for me to say. A backward compatibility key that you plug into your Xbox 720 and it'll be like, it's a discless machine. Yeah. So the Xbox 360 disc would have to go in your Xbox 720, but the key of the remodeled Xbox would unlock the power. That's really that's a straightforward system. That's going to work, isn't it? Do you know it? what that sounds like? <laughs> Madness. No, it doesn't. It actually makes some sort of sense. Do you remember when Sony was saying that they were going to take the cell chip and embed it in all sorts of different mm. devices, like yeah. it would be built into a TV, so it could become a PlayStation TV that then... Yeah. That you could have that backwards compatibility or you could stream stuff. So maybe, maybe that's what they're thinking with kind of leveraging the 360 back catalogue and stuff. So just before we uh, leave the land of Microsoft behind, one uh, one game which is potentially switching from current gen to mm. next gen, Dan, is Rise. That's is that the the sort of Spartacus-y sort of game? Yeah, it's it's Crytek. We're more famous for grey nano suited men in New York. Uh, their next game is well, it's not rumored. It you know it is because they've shown gameplay footage already. Is like a three hundred style uh, maul em up. That's not even a right way to say it. It's a brawler with blood and guts, and it uses Kinect. And when they when they demoed it, they showed like a man you know, brawling with his hands, and he did like a headbutt, which is most uncivilised for a man wearing a hat like mine. And and the guy, you know, on the opposite side of the screen, bloodied and all that sort of thing. Now... This was, what, a couple of years ago now, wasn't it? About two years ago, and it all went quiet. Now, the rumour is, is it's gone quiet because it's now going to Xbox 720 as a showcase for the enhanced, you know, responsiveness of Kinect 2.0. All right, well, let us know what you think of that. Is, is Kinect one of the things that excites you about the next gen? Tell us in the comments. Don't comment on the hats, we won't like it. So a new console generation means new technology used to power the games that, uh, that run on those uh, systems. Last week, Dan, in the episode, we talked a bit about the new Unreal Engine, which is likely to be uh, hugely commonly used by, uh, by different developers around the world. Uh, but this week, we're going to look at a few other engines which are being used to develop next generation games. And first off... Uh, we're going to take a quick look at the one that Activision showcased, which was uh, at GDC recently in San Francisco. 
And uh, this was being shown off by Activision's technical director, Jorge... George? Jorge, <laughs> yeah. Jorge Jimenez. Uh, and he said that better graphics would facilitate uh, better stories, more emotional depth. Uh, he said, we believe this technology will bring current generation characters into next generation life. Is that, is that the vibe you got when looking at these faces? I mean, that sounds like a big slice of first word pie. Um, but I will say the faces were really impressive. I mean, the, the, the key face was like a bald headed man. Now, whether again, that's because faces are good and hair's bad. I don't know. But I thought certainly that the bald dude, you know, um, pretty close to reality. And there's a big gap between actual reality and, you know, not quite. But I thought like the wrinkling around his eyes and things was incredible. And the actual eyes and the motion of his eyes was like almost spot on. It seems to become a de facto thing now that whenever you're showing for a new piece of, uh, of engine tech like this, mm. you have to use a super wizened old man to, I guess, really get those liver spots and those roomy eyes and those kind of wrinkly, uh, all those kind of crow's feet and wrinkles. So I, mm. I suppose show all the, all the kind of detail off. I mean, do you believe that that assertion that several developers are making that kind of more more detail equals more emotional resonance? I mean, maybe it does. Maybe because as a human being, you respond to something that looks real more dramatically. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, again, you don't notice the fact that a face looks real in films. It's about other factors, but it's almost like a de facto. So when the faces are at that level, it can only help, certainly. You know, I think if you can get across in the wink of an eye or a little winkle of the nose, if that's even possible, you know, a little bit of emotion or a tell. And this is what, you know, L.A. Noir was built around, the idea of, facial tells and they built an entire motion capture system just to get across that degree of subtlety. But the argument, because the argument is always made about the uncanny valley, isn't it? That the nearer you get to real, then the more the more any flaws stand out and your brain your brain recognises that these mistakes are there and almost sort of rejects it like a like a hastily mm. transplanted pig liver. Um, this uh, these heads that you're seeing now, they were running uh, they were running at 180 frames on a GeForce GTX 680 and that sort of a uh, the thing that always reminds me of is that when I'm thinking about GeForce <laughs> GTA is, is when they do these sorts of tech demos, mm. they're obviously able to throw all the kind of comp computational power at just getting a single head not doing that much looking incredible. The proof of the pudding uh, is always when these these assets are then transposed into an actual game environment. We'll, we'll, we'll come to that in, uh, shortly with Metal Gear Solid. But another chap who's been showing off uh, wizened heads was David Cage at the PlayStation event, and he had a particularly mm. uh, particularly chilling savala like that he used to, to show that off. And Cage was, Cage was a great one, I guess, for making these sorts of arguments about emotion as well. And he said, uh, we're starting to reach a point where we can see very subtle emotions on the face of a character, where you can feel his emotions just from looking at his face. He, he went on to claim, you can see his soul just from looking into his eyes. Could you see that man's soul? Yes, and it was dark and chilling. <laughs> no, I couldn't. I, I, actually, I think, you know, eyes are one of the things we get right. Where I think you can see a man's soul, or rather his darkness within, is when these 3D render characters open their mouths yeah. and you get polo mint teeth and then this sort of like, you know, maybe when I open my mouth, you'll get a different effect, but you get like a yawing blackness with the Yeah, the not, enough atten not enough attention paid to the, the mouth. Yeah, you want some sort of lighting within the cavern of a man's mouth. Cage was talking about translucency effects and realistic eye shaders and volumetric lighting, mm. but he should have been talking about teeth tech. That is where, uh, yeah, that teeth, is the next great generation. The only leak. reason I can tell you're real now is I know they're your teeth. The state of my teeth. <laughs> <laughs> thanks, thanks a lot. <laughs> Uh, but then moving on to then uh, the, the the Fox Engine demonstration that was given at GDC, where they they revealed that Metal Gear Five was going to be uh, the Phantom Pain plus uh, Metal Gear mm. Solid Ground mm. Zeroes. Mm. But they also did a lot of lighting talk, and a, a big thing for Kojima's team is the use of uh, things like deferred rendering and the, the the way the new ways they're using to light scenes. Um, I was really impressed by it, despite, again, not really understanding that many of the words. I don't know if you can explain Albedo lighting to me, Dan, or perhaps, uh, perhaps, perhaps after I'll tea save, later. I'll save that for next week. Yeah, yeah, we'll build up to that. But you've been to see that. How scalable is that tech? Because that seemed like they were almost delivering next-gen results on mm. on, th on theoretically current-gen current gen systems. But then again, everything's being shown on a PC, so it's hard to say, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, I saw it running uh, for the new Pro Evolution Soccer game, which I'm not allowed to say is PES 2014, but probably is. Um, they showed me like a series of real objects next to their render version. So they, they showed me like a football, a textured football next to the, uh, you know, the modelled version using, and again, it's not Fox Engine, they use a version of Fox Engine. But if anything, the real football looked look, worse. Look worse. 
Uh, because, and again, what this is what you're telling me now. Reality is worse. Yeah, reality is worse. Real, in fact, fake is more crumpled and real looking than real. Because they, they showed me a pair of football boots that were real versus the modelled versions and the fake ones. No, good God. The real ones. This is like first year philosophy and yeah. me realising I've made a terrible <laughs> choice. Of, the real oh. ones look faker because no player had ever worn them. But the CGI ones, they'd like created rim, you know, crinkles in them. So as a result, they're the ones your brain said. The other ones are too perfect, even though they were literally real, and the fake ones are in fact more real looking because they look more battered and deformed. But this tech's definitely getting used in MGS5. I mean, that's a game mm. that's still currently only announced for, for current generation systems. Are you willing to bet your, uh, your lovely hat that it will appear on PS4 next I'll, Xbox? I'll bet my hat and the left side of my moustache that uh, indeed it's coming to next gen. Now, and again, that might be part of how Metal Gear Solid 5 is delivered, you know, whether they, they deliver a little part this generation it jumps across generations, we don't know, but the tech is definitely scalable. Pro Evolution Soccer's being made, well, you know, we think definitely for this generation, and, you know, at some stage they're going to have to leap, and they're building it on the same technology. Last time they didn't so much leap, was run straight into the hurdle, and then to the water yes, behind the hurdle. They possibly didn't make the jump fire. to the current gen. But yeah, they're ready for it this time, and the tech, you know, the tech's very impressive. What it does really well is it creates great results from very low polygon models, that's why the current gen stuff looks as incredibly good as it does. So, you know, it's all about the mapping and the texturing and the lighting and that kind of effect. Well, that's it for this week. Some uh, some interesting PS4 and next Xbox chat, plus some pretty dirty engine uh, discussions despite our failure to command the actual technical terms. We'll be back next week with more talk about what to expect from the next generation. For now, we are the League of Next Gentlemen. Thanks for watching and don't forget to subscribe.